uh, the types of all these three arguments it picks the method and runs that okay um, so so uh, to give you an example um, let's look at the star function inside Julia which, which is uh, as you might have guessed it does multiplication so if you look at methods of star it tells you that it has 181 methods so there are different ways of uh, multiplying you know booleans uh, with a complex boolean for example or a big integer with a big float or complex number with a complex number we can actually click on it and it will take you to github and go to the source line inside julia source code where this function is defined for example i just clicked on the complex method uh, for for multiplication and this is the definition real part of z into real part of w minus um, i mean the, so uh, that's multiple dispatch. Uh, let's see uh, what happens if you multiply. Uh, oh yeah, so here's a curious method, multiplying strings. So in Julia, for, uh, for uh, the reason that star is um, not, what is it, commutative, uh, the, uh, the operator is star for concatenation. So you say, hello star world, and it concatenates the strings uh, but if you say hello plus word it says uh, there is no method to add two strings but you can define that in the next line I am doing that so I import this symbol plus from base base is the base Julia language so I import uh, this plus function from there and then I say ok so if plus is given x string y string then do this so here we are concatenating but with a space in the middle so if I say hello plus word, it's saying hello space word, um, and uh, so sum was defined inside base. I haven't defined it here, um, and it's defined in terms of plus. Okay, so since it's defined in terms of plus, it starts to work for uh, for an array of strings. So uh, I just defined the plus operator here. Sum is using that inside. So it starts to so once you define a method. All the other generic functions defined in terms of that method will start to work. So this is dif uh, different from the C++ type of uh, overloading in which everything is static. It does not do this dynamic thing. Um, so one example of how multiple dispatch is uh, beneficial. This is a snippet of code taken from matplotlib. Uh, it is quaver plot. So if you can see here there are four cases. Uh, first one is uh, the dimension it is dispatching on is the dimension 1 do, do this if it is not do something else and then next it is doing how many arguments are given to this function uh, do one thing there again um, there is some condition here um, and then do another thing if the argument is not uh, number of arguments is not 2 um, so this could have been written in Julia using 4 different methods which you can insert from anywhere uh, new packages can come and add more methods to it and so on um, so that is multiple dispatch you can read more about this on the Julia manual uh, so I am going to quickly move on to uh, a real world demo of using Julia in data analytics, uh, analytics okay. so, uh, it's, so I am going to walk you through this notebook where we uh, we uh, take uh, a data set from the TrueFX uh, a TrueFX data set you can google this uh, it is it's a foreign exchange data set where uh, for every trade in the in the foreign exchange ma market uh, there is uh, it keeps a log of all the trades so we have uh, data for 2000 from 2009 to 2016 uh, it distributed in 1,380 uh, files, but we are taking a small subset, which uh, uh, but uh, of it uh, for 2016. Uh, let's see. So let's just look at one of the files and see what's in there. Uh, so this file uh, contains, you know, what's the currency pair being traded, and the timestamp, and uh, uh, the uh, bid and ask values. Okay. So uh, I don't want to run this because this takes like three sec three minutes. Uh, 
so this 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 is basically reading 180 uh, CSV files and uh, st storing it in a binary format uh, using Julia DT. Um, <coughs> so once you store it in a binary format, like loading it back is instantaneous. You can see that finished in uh, uh, 46 milliseconds. Um, so it, it actually stores it in a binary format, and then when you load it, it memory maps the files so that when you do some operation, the I/O overhead is removed, basically. Um, so you can take like subsets of the data. You can index into the data using using uh, the uh, values you want. So I am saying here that I I only want to see uh, euro to uh, Japanese yen and USD to Japanese yen uh, for these dates for 2016 February first uh, to uh, to I guess May 31st. So this da this data set only contains those uh, those objects. So let's look at how many rows are there in this. So there are uh, 1.6 billion rows in this data set. So uh, the f filtering operation just like works uh, really quickly. Um, so another filtering op operation I'm running here. Um, so th this is actually running on 20 processes. Initially, I added 20 processes. So if, if you see n workers, it will tell you it's 20 uh, once that other cell is ran, uh, has run. Um, so this means that there are 20 Julia processes on this machine, which are re uh, receiving requests to do the computation and then doing it. Um, I'm sorry? It's a process. It's multiprocessing. So uh, it's actually distributed memory parallelism. You say, when you say load these files, everyone is going to load their own uh, you know, subset of files and then do the operation. Um, is there any specific system requirements for this No, you can just run it on your laptop. I am running it on a, a 70 core machine because I want 20 processes. Um, yeah, no, you can just run it on your laptop or in the cloud. And it, it even works on a distributed, uh, I mean, if you have a cluster also it works. If you have a distributed file system, it, it just works. So um, I am defining a function here which does a five minutes window um, using the dates uh, module inside Julia. Um, So th this operation essentially read the whole data. Uh, it's about 70 GB of it, and then did the filtering in about 20 seconds. Um, and this is pretty expensive filtering. You're, you're filtering uh, all strings containing USDs. Um, let's see. Okay, so the next thing is windowing. I am doing a five minute window here, saying convert the data uh, dimension two, which is that, which is this. Uh, timestamp uh, into five minute windows and then aggregate it using minimum and maximum. Um, so that's done. So I can save any intermediate result I have into onto disk using you know a save function and it, it again stores it in the efficient binary format um, and load it instantaneously. Um, so the five minute window actually has uh, about a million rows, uh, which is easier to work with if you want to plot it and stuff. So another feature of this JuliaDB package is it, it gives you, okay, so. okay. Um, this is an example of plot, plotting it. Uh, I had some interactive demo there, uh, it didn't work. Uh, so the next example here is, so, so you've seen I'm using a data frames like package to deal with data here. But since we are in this language which is highly powerful and there is an ecosystem of other packages which people have written, I can basically drop in anything into my data frames kind of package and then make something that is bigger than the sum of parts. Um, so here I am using this package called jump. It stands for Julia um, 
mathematical programming or uh, yeah so it's a, it's an optimization package you give it some constraints uh, and it will try to give you what are the values of variables that satisfy this constraint um, and this is an arbitrage function here you are giving the current value trading value of u euro to usd euro to gbp euro to uh, yens uh, and so on and then what this does is it sets up this constraint equation where it says okay i want a, i want uh, to ca calculate this value d where all these conditions are satisfied so all of the uh, trades are positive uh, and when i when i do the conversions i end up with a difference which is 10000 so here we are saying okay given these arbitrage uh, these um, you know um, exchange values tell me how much of what i need to sell or what i need to buy so that i end up with 10000 dollars at the end of this transaction okay so uh, this is the classic uh, foreign exchange arbitrage you buy one one currency sell it as um, sell it um, sell um, you buy one currency wait for 5 minutes and then sell it uh, to the uh, sell, uh, sell it to the market and you get some so i ran that function this at everywhere macro defines that function on all the processes um, so I'm loading my five minutes data set and then I have a bunch of functions here. That's bad. That's Does it work with APIs to connect to sources of live data on the data? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we actually had a demo of that. If you look up um, our presentation from, okay. Uh, uh, from uh, the uh, Julia Day at, in New York, there is a demo of that um, uh, with this data set only, uh, so you can find find out about that. So I, I'm saying, okay, uh, I don't know what what just happened, but I read and ran this notebook, and some things are not working. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just going to not run the cells because some of them failed. Uh, anyway, so. You can get the arbitrage data. The, the optimization package runs on each row and then gives you the values. And then you can see the arbitrage data like this. It's saying, OK, trade these the, the first currency, uh, this much of the first currencies, uh, this much of the second currency, and so on. Um, not sure. Hopefully, this will work. Okay, I'm running some more windowing functions. Let's see. Uh, okay, here's a plot of the standard deviation for different uh, currency pairs over time. So this this is basic. You know, uh, you, you get a data set and you want to see what what's in that that, that kind of uh, analysis. So I have 30 minutes left. Uh, I am going to hand it over to Ranjan for uh, the rest of the talk. Thank you all.